Greetings, Van Dickens here, pastor of the Monroe United Methodist Church in Monroe, Iowa. Welcome to our Bible study time. Today's Bible study is for the last week of August. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day eager to learn from you. Open our minds to your wisdom and truth. May we be a vessel for you. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us so that your light may shine on us as we who live according to your word and your will and your love, as you have taught us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we have made a, a lot of progress in our study of the book of Romans. Last week we finished chapter 11, and now we begin chapter 12. Always remember that uh, this uh, opus of Paul is really his uh, his great work in under in in understanding the the uh, the thrust that he wants to uh, to share with the people in Rome that he had yet to meet his understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how he understands who they are as new Christians. And he couches it all in the context of the righteousness of God. And in chapter 12, he begins to go into greater detail as to what this righteousness looks like in the lives of those whom God has chosen. In other words, the, uh, the, the children of God, uh, whether they are Jew or Gentile, uh, under the one lordship, of Christ. He explains what this looks like. And so let's not uh, delay any further in our reading. It begins in chapter 12, as I said, and he says, he writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministry, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhorting, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. So let's stop at this point. We'll, we'll read further as we get, get further on, but there are several things that he has said that we want to uh, to take a look at, beginning with the very uh, first. And he says, I appeal to you, therefore. Now, that's a big word, the therefore. You have to kind of uh, rear back and, and look at well, what is he saying, therefore, to, because that makes uh, all of chapter 12 a, a hinge from uh, an argument that he has been building up and then leads him to say, therefore. So what is the therefore? Well, uh, if you if you look back just a few verses uh, towards the later part of chapter 11, you realize that he's been talking about God's great mercy for both Jew and Gentile uh, and how in God's great house there is room. In other words, God's great mercy. There is room for uh, both the Jew, God's chosen people, and all the other nations, all the Gentiles. Uh, case in, the, the proof of that is in the uh, the conversion of so many Gentiles to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, connected with that understanding of, of God's great mercy is the reversal. We talked about that last week. How uh, God's mercy has been shown in a in a in a reversal, whereas the it was thought that the that God's mercy would first be extended to the Jews and then to everyone else. But now you see a time in Paul's time where uh, the Jews rejected Jesus 
and the Gentiles accepted Jesus. And so God has reversed giving uh, as if giving to the younger son the inheritance versus the older son. Uh, Paul uses some old, uh, older uh, scriptural um, references to when God, uh, in God's mercy, God reversed expectations. And so uh, in, in this case, God's righteousness is uh, being offered. God's mercy is being offered to all and the means whereby we may attain God's righteousness and be counted as God's children through uh, faith, through faith in Christ. So that's what the therefore is leading. So therefore, since God is such a merciful God, uh, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, what does he mean here? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's very those are very specific words here. Presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice. And it may not make as much sense to you and me today as it did to uh, the original audience. Uh, remember that for, uh, for common temple worship in, in Judaism, sacrifice was common. Animal, some kind of a physical sacrifice. Uh, whatever the animal may be, or if you were too poor to purchase a lamb, uh, it could be a pair of turtle doves, or if you didn't have that, it could be a grain offering, uh, some kind of uh, food that would be sacrificed as a, a sign of your uh, penitence and uh, one of the uh, requirements uh, for atonement. So Paul is saying here that there's no longer the need for a ritual animal slaughter, uh, but rather present yourselves as a living sacrifice. There's still the need for a body of some sort, and that body is you, the human being, to present it. Not to be slaughtered, but as a, uh, a living sacrifice of giving your life over to God. Um, and uh, in, in your doing this, you are no longer, in verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. The world has a way of molding us into its image when we, when we let it. And that's all the time. We, we inevitably uh, find ourselves uh, being impacted by the world around us. And that leads to corruption and sin, of course. Um, I think of in Paul's day. I mean, even now we have the expression, when in Rome do as the Romans do, and that's not always a good thing. Uh, a lot of people in Rome were doing some pretty despicable things. Uh, today, I guess in the United States, it's uh, not to pick on uh, Nevada, but uh, you know, when in what, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You know that that kind of being conformed to the debauchery of certain places. Um, I lived in New Orleans, and there's a lot of New Orleans that I dearly love, and there are a lot of wonderful Christians in New Orleans. But you can let yourself give way to a lot of the debauchery that is also in New Orleans. Uh, that happens. So he's saying, don't be conformed. Don't let uh, the image of the world uh, be, be your image, but rather be, be transformed by the renewal of your minds. Uh, and it's, it's like what the difference between being conformed and being transformed. It's like it's more than behaving a little bit less CAD-like, um, but a complete renewal. It's a you are no longer that former person that we that God could not do very much. Uh, with as is. God had to infuse Christ into you and make you a new, living, breathing, justified uh, Christian through faith. And so 
with that old self being sloughed off and being trans uh, and being replaced by the the new self you have a new mind you have a new vision you, you can see clearly the uh, the error of your of your ways and the error of the world imagine uh, days when you hung around with certain people that looking back on you realize you know they weren't all that good of an influence on me and the the more you're able to look at back at hindsight you realize man I don't I can't imagine today hanging out with that kind of crowd because of their values and what they stood for and the things they said, how they conducted themselves. Uh, but at that time, uh, you were willing to be um, conformed, if you will, to to their way of thinking. But now you, you look and you see, you know, I'm not at all like that. Um, and a lot of the things that they did, I, I would never think of doing today. Well, that's that's sort of what Paul is talking about when he talks about being transformed. Uh, when you are immersed in God's will, which normally comes about by hanging out with a good crowd. In other words, uh, other Christians in various settings, including your, your own Christian congregation, that when you're immersed in that environment, um, and then when you immerse your heart in uh, the things that are of God, you you see clearly what is acceptable and, and what is uh, good and what is perfect, to use Paul's words here in, chap in, in verse 2 of chapter 12. Now, cha verse 3 of chapter 12, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the measures of faith. For, he says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And then he goes goes on into uh, describing that. But let's take a look at what measure of faith means. Does that mean that uh, some have more faith and some have less faith? Think about it. Uh, we, in verse 6, we have gifts that differ according to the grace given of us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry and ministry, the teacher and teaching, the exhorting and exhorting, the giving generosity, the leader and diligence, the compassionate and cheerfulness. And all that has to do with what it means to uh, have your measure of faith that God has assigned. I don't think that is talking about as if someone had, like, we've all been given faith jugs. And my jug is halfway full, and your jug is only a quarter of the way full. And uh, every now and then we see someone with three quarters of a full jug. Is that what that means? As if if you have more faith, you're a little bit better than, than the other person? No, far from that. That's not at all what Paul means. In fact, he, he tells people, the Romans to not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. So it's it's um, it's why we shouldn't look at faith as something that someone has more of and others have less of, but rather faith in terms of what God has uh, apportioned to you to do with the faith that we all have. Uh, faith is expressed in different ways, in other words. And for some of us, it's in prophecy. Uh, others, it's ministry. Others, teaching. Others, exhorting and, and, and preaching. Others, giving. Others uh, have proven that uh, the measure of faith for you is in your leadership. Uh, others uh, exude the ability to show compassion. So those are seven examples that Paul gives of differing gifts that we have each been given as our own apportionment, our own measure of faith. Doesn't mean that you have more faith than me. Doesn't mean I have more faith than you. Now, Paul, in talking about those differing gifts, uh, he gave seven um, that's sort of a generalized view of, of gifts. It's not all. I mean, he doesn't mention 
tongues or interpretation or healing or knowledge or or even apostleship, Paul being an apostle himself, uh, he doesn't talk a whole lot about the ministry of, of, of apostles uh, as much as he does other things. But um, those are examples that Paul has given us. Uh, the fact that they are seven examples, I don't, I don't know, want to read too much into that, but um, those are examples of differing gifts. Now, verse 9, uh, we pick it up, and uh, we haven't read this, so let's finish out uh, chapter 12. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. So let's uh, let's stop right there. We'll finish out that chapter in, in a moment. But I, I don't want to get too bogged down in, in uh, later verses before we've had a chance to look at at, at uh, what's happening here in verse nine. In in verse nine, Paul is leading us to the goal of what it means for us to be righteous in, in God's uh, eyes and by the, the grace that has been given to us by the measure of, of faith that, uh, that we have. Uh, he, he leads this to words that sound uh, interestingly familiar to us. We've heard uh, Paul write about or listen to as Paul writes about love in other uh, letters of his, uh, I think of 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter, Galatians 5, 22. It goes into detail here uh, with the Romans as, what, as to what love means. And I love that he puts uh, meat to the bone. Uh, it's not just a, a feeling you know, woo, you know, uh, anybody can say, oh, I love you, woo, and, and a lot of uh, new uh, partners, new couples uh, will look at each other and say, oh, I love you, and not really understand what they're talking about. It's just a bunch of feelings, uh, romantic feelings, you, 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 and, and then sometimes uh, they, uh, the, the couple will, um, see in their uh, in, in their feelings toward the other person a, an image of that uh, other as as the the perfect person until they've lived with the person for a while and realize oh you're, you're not you're not perfect you you've got all kinds of interesting things about you that make for a challenge for me but early in a uh, in many a relationship uh, when we say I love you, it's, it's, it's a lot of emotions and not a whole lot of stuff, a lot of uh, action. And it takes time for most couples, and not just couples, but families, congregations, communities, to really learn how to practice love in practical ways. And Paul gives us a lot of uh, examples of what that means. In, in verse 9, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Let your love be, be genuine. What does that mean? Let your love be genuine. I think it has to do with how we care for one another. Um, and Sometimes I've seen in ministries of uh, outreach beyond the church to those who are less fortunate that uh, occasionally a person will uh, offer what they consider to be love, an expression of love, to that person 
uh, but it's more of uh, self-interest and making them feel uh, so good. I'm I'm so I'm such a good Christian. Look at what I'm doing, and not so much simply for the welfare of that other person. I think that's what Paul is talking about. Uh, let your love come from a generous from a from a genuine motive, and less for self interest. Um, and then when he in, in verse 10, he begins, uh, and, and following, he gives uh, bullet points or many different examples of what, what this means. So, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, uh, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Those are five examples of what it means to be genuinely showing love. And I, I'll let you uh, ponder those five uh, on your own time, but I pick up uh, persevere in prayer. What, what does he mean by persevering in prayer? Some of us um, pray when we feel like it, and some of us uh, don't feel like it, so we're not going to pray. And I think what Paul is saying is that whether you feel like it or not, whatever your mood may be, pray. Let that be a regular part of your life, and you'll find that God can speak to you even when you don't feel like praying, but you, you do pray nevertheless. Then in verse 14, yeah, I, I just I get back to 13, contribute to the needs of the saints. Uh, in other words, uh, Make a valuable contribution to fellow Christians. That's one. Extend hospitality to strangers. That's a different, another different community of, of people. And your hospitality uh, is, in other words, it's not just to people that you like, but to people that, that you don't know. Verse 14 uh, picks up, and here are these. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. That sounds familiar. It should. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. In other words, humility. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. Now, he's, he's going directly from the playbook of Jesus himself. But nevertheless, he's, uh, he's giving a, a number of very practical examples of what love means. Do not repay evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I love that. I love that passage. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it's written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. you got to remember that in Paul's day, there was a movement among some that Rome needs to be overthrown. And and they are the very ones to do it. And so you had a, a huge revolt uh, around 70, the Maccabean revolt, and uh, it was quashed completely. And Paul is saying, uh, not take, not, it's not just uh, a revolt against the whole of government, but a revolt against authority. Um, to let, let that be something that is driven by God and not by your own individual motive. Otherwise, you'll end up with uh, a bunch of vigilantes uh, and in our own uh, nation's history, lynch mobs. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Know if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. All those um, passages, all those verses have to do with how you 
show love. How you show love. And um, by showing love, uh, you are fulfilling the law. And we're going to get into that in, in chapter 13. It's all uh, connected. Chapter 13, then. Are you ready? Okay. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. This is a shift now in his, in his thinking. He was focusing on um, the, the community of believers, and now he's addressing how they stand over and against society, over and against, in this case, the government. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval." For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid. For the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It's the servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants, busy with this very thing. Pay to all what is due them. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Revenue to whom revenue is due. Respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. And we'll stop at that point. Uh, that's 13, 1 through, 1 through 7. The church in relationship to authority. Why did Paul place that at that point in his letter? Well, um, Paul had a lot of respect for authority because up until that point it was authority that kept Paul from being lynched. By appealing to Rome, Paul kept the mobs from taking uh, matters into their own hands and stoning him. He appealed because he was a Roman citizen. And uh, so he understands the purpose of authority of the government. And he's read his Bible. He knows that even God, according to the prophets, saw um, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar as uh, Babylon's uh, king, as a servant of God uh, to uh, uh, bring about a change in Israel. Uh, Cyrus, the ruler, the Assyrian ruler, was seen as God's instrument uh, so Paul has seen a track record in the past where all authority, all governing bodies fall under God's willing and God uses them as an instrument of his righteousness. Uh, so Paul tells the, the Romans, even though uh, they have seen their share of corruption and they're going to see a lot more corruption uh, once uh, Nero has been in office for a while. Uh, more corruption than they can ever imagine. and uh, But at this point, uh, he's telling them, respect it. Uh, let us not let the Christian faith be seen as uh, anarchists. Uh, respect government. The, the, and, and, the, and his justification is because they fall under the will of God. And, and that's, in a way, a, uh, a corrective to the idea that we should be blindly loyal to to government uh, regardless. Uh, no, no, he's not saying that. Uh, he is saying that government, when it's working, when it's functioning, uh, it's led by wise and uh, just rulers. And because of that, they carry out God's justice. Uh, it's one reason why I have such a tremendous respect for the military. Uh, it would be not too good if I didn't, having uh, had a career uh, in the Navy. But I 
uh, very much lean on Paul's understanding of the government for that purpose. And for those uh, who are uh, of a mind that uh, we should uh, renounce the, the, the ruling authorities and we should uh, make a whole new system, uh, I'm thinking of a lot of uh, lawless activity these days. Uh, that, uh, that goes just so far uh, until your home is robbed or someone murders a friend of yours. Um, things like that can uh, begin to question, well, maybe we do need the authority. You know, who are you going to call? There's no such thing as ghostbusters. Uh, the only thing, only body I know to call when something bad's happened is the police. And I have done that before. So I'm very glad and very respectful to the authorities. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Uh, and when they are not perfect, then there are ways to address that. But, uh, but the main thing, why give respect to the authorities? Uh, even if they are, even if they have occupied your your territory, as uh, Rome did to so many uh, places, including uh, Israel and Judah, because they operate under the will of God, uh, as opposed to their own divine will. So in a way, he's, he's correcting uh, some corrupt rulers' understanding of what their authority is. Uh, Caesars, in his day, eventually saw themselves as divine and uh, so that meant that uh, they are not subject to anyone. That They are the, the top uh, tier. And Paul is saying, no, no, you're not. You fall under the will of God. And when you do not fall under the will of God and behave in a um, dictatorial, self-serving manner, and you're no longer serving uh, the people uh, with with justice, then you have become corrupted. And that is not what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking in much more general terms than just uh, a corrupt Roman government. He's talking about the, the idea of government itself. So, um, that is why. And then he, he, he continues on. Uh, he's saying in verse 7, Taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. And that sounds very familiar when you remember that uh, in the words of Jesus, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and under God the things that are God. And I don't, I don't know if Jesus had a high lofty view of Caesar, but even Jesus had respect and uh, acknowledged the role of authorities. Then in, uh, as we continue in verse 8, Paul says, Oh, no one anything except to love one another. And so he gets back to that, that theme of where God's righteousness is leading us to, how we ourselves are righteous, and that is through love. What kind of love? What are you, t what are you talking about? Well, he has he's explained a lot of that already when he uh, explains that. Uh, love for um, for one another, for your own community, for the stranger. Uh, and now he says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So, all other commandments are considered offshoots of that. If you are proactive, then you are fulfilling all the law. Proactive with your, with your love. Uh, in... Going back in chapter 13, verse 5, uh, take a look at that real quick with me. Verse 5 reads, Therefore one must be subject not only because of wrath, 
but also because of conscience. So, just to get back for a minute, uh, talking about uh, the role of authority. Not out of wrath, but out of conscience. Out of conscience, we should offer respect. Wrath has to do with the consequences of of sin, uh, punishment. Conscience, because you've internalized the legitimacy of the government. You want to be in sync with the uh, purpose of the government. So I, I just wanted to take a look real quick at that. Uh, when he uses the words wrath, uh, but uh, conscience, what the difference of that that means. And then in uh, in verse 11, going on forward, he ends the chapter by saying, Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, and the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, and here's a key phrase, instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify his desires. This idea of taking off and putting on, uh, he uses that, that image taking off and, and putting on, like clothing, when he says, instead put on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh. He uses uh, the expression, uh, let us lay aside the works of darkness and put on Christ. But to me, when I think of that, I think of clothing, where you, you're taking off uh, dirty clothes and you're putting on clean clothes. And I'll tell you what I and what I have read others seeing in that expression, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a baptismal uh, image that we have. When little children are, are baptized, they often have on a baptismal gown, uh, usually a, a white gown, uh, not always, but uh, traditionally. And Traditionally, when adults have been baptized, not so much today, but uh, in the past, they would put on a white gown uh, as their men and women put on a white gown. You have uh, beautiful uh, pictures of people walking down into the river with their white gowns. They are putting, it's symbolic, they are putting on Christ. So when you put on Christ... Uh, what does that mean? Well, if you've been reading up until this point, it means showing, uh, expressing uh, the love that Christ has and not your rendition of love, which is always a corrupted form of, of love. But when we put on Christ, then we are transformed and our love is of a, a godly nature. And what does it look like? Well, if you read... Uh, chapters 12 and 13, it includes things like hmm, benevolence, peace, if it, if it is at all in your power to live peaceably with others, sobriety, uh, pureness, meaning pure in your motives, uh, harmonious, living in, in harmony with, with others, especially with other believers, so that you can be a witness to the world. Uh, to It means to bless those, not necessarily those who bless you, but also blessing those who persecute you, doing good to your enemies instead of uh, giving it back to them, feeding the enemy, giving the enemy something to drink, clothing uh, the enemy, being kind, being patient, uh, praying always, whether you feel like it or not, uh, showing respect to authorities, 
is a, an example of showing love to the world. Uh, not taking matters into your own hands. Uh, all these are ways in which we let love fulfill the law. So those two, two little chapters uh, go into great detail as to what it means to be righteous. And the ultimate is how you show love as a Christian, as a transformed Christian. We will continue our study as we uh, move on in chapter 14. But until then, God bless and keep you. I encourage you to read chapters 14 and 15. We may not get all the way through 15, but we're making a lot of progress. We're getting towards the, the later part of his wonderful letter, his wonderful Magna Carta. God bless and keep you and do good. Show your love to others in very specific ways. God bless.